Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. So the previous classes have all come from Bishop Theodore Eastman's work, The Baptizing Community. Now we're going to shift to this book, which is known as The Rights of the Church. The Church has two thick volumes of rights, some of which include baptism and confirmation and the right of Christian initiation, Christian initiation for adults. So we're going to go from the work that we've been studying, the history of baptism now, to the actual rights that we use in the church. As a bit of background, the rights that we have as a church now were revised after the 1960s. So in the Second Vatican Council, in the early 1960s, when all 2,000 bishops of the church met together at the Vatican, they decided to revise the rights of the church. And so the fruit of that is today what we know of as the rights of the church, the revised sacramental rights of the church. So in our study this evening, we're going to focus first on the right of baptism for children, and then after that we'll focus on the right of the baptism of adults, which we know of as the right of a Christian initiation for adults. So we're hoping this evening to cover two topics. The first one then is the, the baptism of children, and then the other we know of as the RCIA, which is the right of Christian initiation for adults. So if you're an adult, there's one process of being initiated into the church. If you're a child, there's another process for being initiated. We'll start first with the baptism of children then. So the revised right for baptism of children comes to us from 1969. So we know that the Second Vatican Council concluded in 1965. They went away from the Vatican and various persons were tasked with the various uh, details from that council. And so four years later we saw the approval of the right of baptism for children. So how do we define children from adults? Who goes into which category? Since we have two rights in the church, the baptism of children and we have the right of Christian initiation for adults, how do we decide who's baptized as a child and who goes into RCIA? A lot of it has to do with, as it suggests here, whether one has reached the age of discernment or what we used to call the age of reason. Have you thought recently about why it is that often First Communion in some churches is saved until 8 or 9 or 10 years old? Why do we wait for, for young people often to receive the communion in some churches like the Roman Catholic Church? They often wait until a, a child is at least 8 or 9 or 10 years old to receive First Communion. Why is that? Because it's believed that that child has reached the age of reason or the age of discernment, which simply means that that child now has a better understanding of what the body and blood of Christ is. As a three-year-old, this child would not have understood in the same way as this child might now at eight or nine or ten years old. This child has reached the age of reason. We recall that in, in our study last week, though, what Bishop Eastman was telling us in his book, The Baptizing Community, is that in the ancient church, everyone of all ages received the Eucharist. So even if you were two or three years old, when we all celebrated the breaking of the bread, all of us received communion, which is why at Holy Family, and in the American Catholic Church in the United States, we don't tend to exclude people. Oh, wait a minute, you're only six years old. No, instead, it's... We recognize that the practice of the ancient church was to include everyone in communion. So, in many places, though, this age of reason has determined then who can be baptized as an infant and who cannot be baptized as an infant. That is to say, if you've not yet reached the age of reason or the age of discernment, then you're allowed to be baptized as a child. But then what happens after that? If you've reached the age of reason, then we put you into classes to be baptized. Follow that? So typically, the catechesis that the church offers is, for instance, there's one set of instruction for the parents and godparents of children because the infants are not old enough to learn yet, right? So the instruction goes to the parents and godparents. But you remember in other parishes where we've been how it is that children at a certain age then can no longer be baptized in this way. Instead, they have to go to a year of classes, said that church in another tradition. Yikes. Think about it for a moment, the implications. Remember, we talked about how it was that why do we baptize infants? Because if they die, 
where will they go? St. Augustine came up with this concept of a place called limbo. He invented original sin and he came up with all sorts of ways to explain this. So now we baptize them quickly as infants, usually within weeks of their birth. Why? Because if something happened to them and they died, they wouldn't go to limbo. Instead, they would enjoy God's presence in heaven. That was the thinking at the time. But now, instead, if you're six or seven or eight years old, what happens? We make you go to classes for a year before you're baptized? Whoa. You see how the thinking doesn't quite... Uh, something is amiss there. So that's why, for instance, in the American Catholic Church in the United States, we focus less on being a part of catechesis or religious education for this one year, and instead, it's opening the doors of the church so that all who want to receive the sacraments can receive the sacraments. Letter B notes how it is that the church has never deprived children of baptism. So we saw last week various examples of how it was that in Scripture, when they baptized, they baptized the entire household. In the Acts of the Apostles, it says that Paul and Timothy came and baptized Lydia and her entire household. Did it say Lydia and all her household minus the children? No, they baptized even the children. So we have an ancient practice of how it is that we baptize not only adults and those could, who could understand, but we also baptized children in the church. The challenge with the baptism of infants, though, is that once you baptize a person, is that enough, really? What happens is it's, we often think of the faith as sort of like a seed that's planted. If you just plant a seed in the ground and then go away, is that enough to trust that the seed will grow? What does it take for the seed to grow? It takes all sorts of watering, nourishing, being in good ground, and the same with the faith too. If we simply take any child and go around to the street and find a child and bring the child in here and baptize that child, what does that mean after baptism? That's simply planting the seed of the faith. Just because we baptize a child, does that mean that the child is going to go home to a home environment where that child is taught about God and about God's love? Where that child is nourished, where that seed is, is nourished so that it can grow and flower? And so as a church, we recognize how important it is, not simply that act of baptizing, but it's this continual process of taking care now of that little plant, which is our child and our child's faith. Jesus used a lot of analogies of seeds, right? How it was that, the, that a seed is planted, but it's the law of the harvest. The seed isn't just planted and then becomes a flower the next day. It's planted and it needs to be nourished. It needs to be nourished as it grows. Ministries and roles in the celebration of baptism. So we think, let's pause to think for a moment how it is that in baptism, different people do different things. So in the last baptisms that we celebrated, we saw that our deacons, Deacon Roy, Deacon Cleovis, Deacon John, did certain things during baptisms. Parents and godparents did certain things during baptism. Members of the congregation did certain things during the baptism. So this is reflecting on the different roles during baptism, what it is that different people do during a baptism. The first focus of this document, interestingly, is on the congregation or on the assembly which is interesting because it was in the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s where we recognized that Christ is present not only in the sacrament that's celebrated, but also among the people. Which is why, beginning with the Second Vatican Council, if you, if you have enough life experience like me to be able to remember these things, before the Second Vatican Council, often our churches had pews, all of them facing in the same direction. With the Second Vatican Council, we realized that, wait a minute, Christ is not just up here in the altar or in the sanctuary. Christ is in that person beside me. Which is why since the 1960s, many churches have been built more in the round with the altar and the ambo in the middle and people facing them because not only are they facing the altar and the ambo, they're also seeing Christ in others. So in this document, we continue that theology of how it is that Christ is present, yes, in the sacrament, but also in the assembly, which is why in the Second Vatican Council, we came up with this concept of active and conscious participation, that our job when we go to Mass is not simply to watch and to pray our rosary or do whatever it is that we're doing. No, our job is to actively participate in what's going on. So what's the role of the congregation then? Can we imagine a baptism to actively 
participate as well. What are some of the ways then that the community participates, that the congregation or the community or the assembly participates? Both before and after the ceremony, the child has the right to the love and the help of the community. Think about that for a moment. What is your responsibility when it comes to baptism, all of us as a community? It's our responsibility to love and to help and to support that child and his or her family, both before baptism and after baptism. It's not just about bringing a kid to church, baptizing them, and then wishing them well and not caring for them again. No. It's about bringing a child into the community and recognizing that that child is now a part of the community. We all have a responsibility for that child. The community also participates in the rite of baptism, and it adds its consent to the celebrant after the profession of faith by the parents and godparents. So during the rite, there's a time when the parents and godparents and all profess the faith. We're professing the faith into which this child is going to be baptized. And then the deacon or priest or bishop says, this is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it through Christ our Lord. Amen. This is whose faith? This is our faith. Interesting. We remember in previous classes how it is that as Catholics, we, we don't pray using the first person singular, I. This is my faith. What do we say? This is our faith. And so by the community being present during the baptism, the community is really part of that ritual. This is our faith into which we're welcoming this newly baptized child. Parents. What role do parents have in the sacrament of baptism? According to the, the revised rites after the 1960s and 1969, this document says, parents have a ministry and responsibility even more important than those ministries and responsibilities of the godparents. So if you're a parent thinking of baptizing, don't think for a moment that it's, your God, it's the godparents' job to raise them in the faith. Who is going to be the primary teacher of that child in the ways of the faith? The parents, mom and dad, or mom and mom, or dad and dad, or mom, single parent families, or dad, or whoever it is, the parents are the most important teachers in the life of that child. The expression that came up after the Second Vatican Council was the domestic church, la iglesia domestica. What does that simply mean? It means that we don't have to go to that building that we call a church in order to learn about God and to pray. The domestic church is recognizing that our homes, our houses, those places where we live, should be a church as well, a place where we pray and a place where we learn about our faith. Don't just think that learning about the faith and praying is something that we do one hour a week, one, hour, one out of every 168 hours. Let Sunday I'll go for one hour to Mass. No, it's as if when we go home too, that our homes should be a sort of church where our children can learn about the faith and pray with us as adults. So, parents have that responsibility, which is even greater than that of the God. Parents, parents should take their part in the right with understanding. They should prepare with prayer, catechesis, and pastoral counseling. So, since these are more infants who have not yet re reached the age of discernment or the age of reason, it doesn't make sense for the kids to sit through a baptism class. Does it make sense to have a baptism class for one and two year olds and tell them what it is that they're going to experience in baptism? Doesn't make sense. They haven't reached that age of being able to understand yet. So who are we going to catechize? Who's the instruction for? It's for the parents and godparents of those children. What does that mean then in this document and simply telling parents and godparents, if you're going to baptize your child, then guess what? You're responsible for that faith. And if anyone should be preparing for that sacrament then, it's not your child, your one or two year old child, or your child who's only a few weeks old. They can't do anything to prepare for the sacrament. Who are the ones who should be preparing? Us. What are some of the ways that we could be preparing? It says some ways we could be preparing include catechesis, which is simply religious education. So that Holy Family, when we give instruction for the sacraments before the reception of the sacraments, that's catechesis. Prayer, oh my, what a concept that we would prayerfully prepare ourselves for the sacraments of the church. 
I'm going to be baptized or confirmed or receive my first communion. What a novel idea that one way to prepare for that is to spend some time in prayer. And another way, pastoral counseling. You know, pastoral counseling typically means seeing someone like a deacon or a priest or a bishop or, you know, someone who has a bit more knowledge in the faith than sometimes we do, and being able to talk with them and share with them our questions, our doubts. Better to have, to, to speak with them about that before baptism than after baptism. I thought, the, I thought the teachers were supposed to raise the kids. Fascinating <laughs> thing, right? And that's that's an excellent concept. With this with this notion of the domestic church, then parents are most directly responsible for the education of their students. So it's not just sending them to school or sending them to Sunday school and entrusting their faith education to their religious education instructors, to their CCD teachers, we used to call them. No, it's recognizing that parents have a primary role in that. Yikes, that's more than we bargained for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Martin Delk is the way we used to see the churches like there's a street that's over here. They would drive in, the hall is back here, drop off the kids, go come right back again them. after an hour later and take them up. Oh. <laughs> that's bad. So part of it is leading to a change in thinking. How do we help parents recognize that, that their role in educating their children in the ways of the faith is absolutely essential? So parents then should be prepared to take part in this, in the sacrament, through things like catechesis and prayer and pastoral counseling. Interestingly, the document says that parents exercise a public ministry during the rite of baptism when, first of all, at the beginning of the rite, they publicly ask that their child be baptized. So the rite begins with a question. The very first question of the rite is, first of all, what name do you give this child? Parents, what name do you wish to give this child? Question number two, what do you ask of God's church for this child? So they are publicly stating that they want their child to be baptized. It's a real ministry. Number two, they sign the child with the sign of the cross. So not only does the deacon or priest or bishop sign with the sign of the cross, but then the parents and godparents do the same. Parents are participating by renouncing Satan and professing their faith as part of the rite. Parents participate by carrying the child to the font. Interesting because we know in the Hispanic culture and in various Latino cultures, you know, in Mexico and Central and South America, there are different cultures in which the godparent actually carries the child to the waters of baptism. A beautiful sign either way, whether it's the parent, which is more predominant in U.S. culture, or the godparent, which is more predominant in Mexico and Central and South America. It's the parents and godparents bringing this child to the waters to be baptized. A certain value to that because we know, of course, in Spanish-speaking countries, we have a tradition of padrinos, of padrasco, which, is, which simply means that Often padrinos are seen of as sponsors, meaning more financial sponsors. Uh, padrinos are the ones who pay for the party after the baptism. Well, it's nice that there's actually a nice symbolism as well that, wait a minute, it's not just about paying for the baptism party, but also in the Latino culture, when the godparents bring the child to be baptized, they're the ones who are often holding the child, a symbol of how it is that they are committing themselves to sharing the responsibility of that child. And I think it's nice that, you know, during the, during the rite that you actually ask the godparents, are they willing to participate in the upbringing? There you go. Yeah. So at the very beginning of the rite, once the parents have declared what it is that they want for their child, that they want the child to be baptized, there's a question for the parents and there's a question for the godparents. What's the question for the parents? Are you prepared to raise this child in the ways of our faith? Because we're not just going to baptize your child and then go away and your child will never know nothing about the faith. The actual question says, you have asked your child to be baptized. In doing so, you are accepting the responsibility of raising him or her in the practice of the faith. It will be your duty to bring him or her up to keep God's work commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and neighbor. Do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? That's the question for parents. Do you really understand what you're doing here? Because you're not just coming to baptize your child and then go away, have a party, and not share with your child anything about the church or about God or about Christ. You're committing yourself to something big here. Do you understand what you're doing by committing yourself to, to, to bringing this child up in the practice of the faith? 
And then after that's a question for the godparents. The question is, godparents, are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? It doesn't say, godparents, are you ready to pay for the reception after the, are you ready to pay for the party after the ceremony? No. Which is nice. You get those questions out of the way before for those who have padrinos. But the question here is, godparents, are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? Are you ready to help these parents in their duty of raising this child in the faith? So, very interesting, because we have different concepts of padrasco in, in different places. So, padrasco, this act of having padrinos, is often the case where we have padrinos of baptism, who are different from the padrinos of Primera Comunión, First Communion, who are different from the padrinos for quinceañera, etc. In the U.S. culture, it's more common to have one set of godparents for life, which is essentially this belief that, okay, the parents are there, helping them not just to pay for a party for a certain event, but are there to help the parents raise this child. Which Father, is um, has the uh, word godparent changed to sponsor now? Ooh, excellent question. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah. But I've seen it um, when my um, grandson did his confirmation. He didn't say godparent, it said sponsor. So it's just the, the use of language here. Typically we use the word godparents more for infant baptism. For sacraments where they're infants, we speak of their parents and godparents. But then what happens once they reach the age of reason? We use different words to refer to them. So in English, typically, then for confirmation, for those young people in the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, when they're, when they're confirmed at, say, 14 or 15 or 16 years old, do we refer to them as godparents during confirmation? Excellent insight. What do we refer to them as? Sponsors. So the word godparents is more a word that we use when they're infants, because they're standing in their place. Their parents and godparents are standing in and professing the faith for them. But then when they're ready to profess the, the faith for themselves as, as adolescents and young adults and later as adults, then they don't have godparents during their celebration so much as sponsors. Other responsibilities of parents and godparents during the rite, how else do they participate in the rite? So they, they bring the child to the waters of baptism and hold the child when the, when the child is baptized. They also hold a lighted candle. So this infant, presuming that these children who are baptized are too young yet to hold candles, I mean, once they're three or four years old or whatever, I mean, it's, it's fine to have a child holding a lighted candle, but at, at three weeks old, I was baptized at three weeks old, at three weeks old, you don't give a child a candle yet. That child is not yet <laughs> grasping out. Who's holding the candle for the child? Parents and godparents. And finally, at the end of the ceremony, the parents and godparents are blessed with a special prayer. And the rite that came out of the 1960s is just a, a prayer for the parents but you see in many churches, including in Holy Family Catholic Church and the, the American Catholic Church in the United States, we bless not only the parents, but also the godparents. We recognize how it is that it's not just the parents who have this role of bringing up this child, but there's this other group of people, these godparents, who've said, we are committed to helping these parents in their task as Christian parents. What do we do now if a parent is present, but if a parent is not able to profess the faith for whatever reason? Say, we have couples where one of the parents is Christian or Catholic, but the other, say, is atheist, doesn't believe in God, or is Buddhist. Or we can think of other reasons for which a parent would not profess the faith. Follow me? If I'm an atheist parent, am I going to profess the Christian faith with my child? What do I do in that respect? The church's solution, then, is that if a parent is present but unable to profess the faith for whatever reason, he or she may keep silent during the ceremony. So the questions are, parents, right? Do you remember the questions there at the beginning of the ceremony? Mm -hmm. Parents, it will be your duty to, to, keep, to bring him or her up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and our neighbor. Do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? So a parent who does not believe or does not profess faith for whatever reason can keep silent during the ceremony, but there has to be some implicit understanding that he or she is willing to have his or her child raised in the faith. 
What sense does it make to baptize a child and then not raise that child in the faith? And so that so typically if we come into those situations where there is a parent who is not professing the faith on behalf of his or her child, then there, at least there's that understanding that this child will be raised in the faith. If you want to baptize this child, why do you want to baptize this child in the Catholic Church unless there's some desire to raise this child in the Catholic faith? And then, if only uh, the responsibility of parents stopped at baptism, to the responsibility stop at baptism, after baptisms, as suggested in the language of the right, then the parents have an, obli an obligation, a duty, of helping that child to know God and to help prepare the child for other sacraments of the church, of bringing that child up in the practice of the faith. The other persons who are involved in the right, then, are godparents, and interestingly, in 1969, the only note that they could think to write about godparents in that book to this day is simply saying that each child may have godparents. Does it say that godparents are required? May have godparents? Interesting language. How it is. Typically, in many dioceses, at least one godparent is required for a sacrament like this. At least one sponsor is required. But going back to those documents that were written in 1969, when the rights were revised, it says that a child may have a godparent. Yes, sir. On that. <clears throat> also, is it true that uh, a child can have a couple of godparents, like two couples of godparents, mm -hmm. but only one gets their name put on the baptismal? That's an excellent question that I've only ever been asked here in Texas because of our proximity to Mexico. Because what is the difference? So in the U.S., predominant U.S. culture, Catholic culture, what happens is a person has a godfather and a godmother for life. What happens in the Hispanic culture with this uh, culture of padrasco, compadrasco, is that, for instance, for a quinceañera, do we have just one set of padrinos for a quinceañera? Oh, my word. We have lots of padrinos. <laughs> and so, right? One is paying for the DJ, and one is paying for the limousine, and one is paying for the dress, and maybe one is paying for the church. Right? We have different padrinos yeah. sponsoring different things. So that practice has crept into other sacraments like baptism, too, or weddings. Weddings is another example, right? Padrinos de lazo, padrinos de arras. That's more a question that is here in Texas because of our proximity to Mexico. What I, I think the pastoral response, remember that word that we always use in these situations, being pastoral. The pastoral response is to acknowledge that there is absolutely no harm in a parent designating several people to be godparents if they understand that they're helping to bring this child up in the way of the faith. Does that make sense? Why exclude them? Now, maybe, maybe there are practical considerations so that, for instance, in our sacramental records, in the books that we keep, or on the certificates that we give out, maybe there's only space for, say, two godparents, but at the same time, is there any harm in allowing other godparents to be part of that ceremony if they are committed to the same tasks to which godparents are committed? The others who are key to the celebration of baptism then are the deacon, the priest, and or the bishop. So ideally, the ordinary ministers, the church always distinguishes between ordinary ministers and extraordinary ministers. Have we heard this maybe with communion? So in communion, we have ordinary Eucharistic ministers and we have extraordinary Eucharistic ministers. Which is Terry and which is Deacon Roy? Think about this for a moment. Is Deacon Roy the ordinary minister or the extraordinary minister? And is Terry the ordinary minister or the extraordinary minister? In this case, then, those who are ordained, the deacons, priests, and bishops of the church are the ordinary ministers, meaning they ordinarily are the ones who do this. So, for instance, in an ordination or an event where we have several ordained persons, then typically they are the ones who ordinarily will be sharing communion with us. However, if there is a shortage of deacons, priests, bishops, and any ceremony, we have extraordinary, extraordinary Eucharistic ministers, which means that those are the persons who are there to help us out. So, ordinarily in baptism, would baptism 
be celebrated ordinarily by ordinary ministers or by extraordinary ministers. Ordinarily, they would be, baptism would be celebrated by ordinary ministers. Which simply means that ordinarily, baptism is celebrated by a deacon or a priest or a bishop. But there are extraordinary circumstances, right? Can we think of an extraordinary circumstance where an extraordinary minister would, would baptize? If you're in the hospital and, there, and someone is thinking that there's the danger of death, don't have time to call the deacon or the bishop or the priest, well then, anyone can step in and serve as an extraordinary minister for the sacrament of baptism. Okay. Anyone can baptize. Janie can baptize. She is an extraordinary minister of baptism. Do you love using that word extraordinary? I'm an extraordinary minister. <laughs> She's an extraordinary minister. In extraordinary cases, if there are no ordinary ministers around, then extraordinary ministers take over and act in the name of the church. Interesting. So the ordinary ministers of baptism, ordinarily baptism is celebrated by a deacon or a priest or a bishop. This document says that they should arrange that the baptism is always celebrated with proper dignity, meaning deacons, priests, bishops. We should always be concerned about celebrating baptism in a dignified way. So however we celebrate it, we should be concerned that we're celebrating it in, in a way that's proper for the sacraments of the church. And it continues, and as far as possible, adapted to the circumstances and wishes of the family's concern. Okay, let's unpack that for a moment. Adapted to the circumstances and wishes of the family. So, depending on the circumstances, recently I was invited to celebrate the baptism the way that the family wanted to celebrate, for whatever reasons, you know, families have their ways of coming to, to these conclusions, but they wanted to celebrate the baptism with family, not in the church, but in their backyard. Okay? It's not ordinarily how we celebrate it, but obviously this family has whatever reasons for which they're thinking, this is better for our family, right? I could inquire into that and get some understanding of, well, why would you want to celebrate in your backyard? But ultimately what they're coming to is this idea that they want to, there, there are certain circumstances which lead them to want to celebrate it differently. Okay. So adapted to the circumstances and wishes of the family's concern. Another wish, if we're to use concrete examples here. I did a, a baptism recently where the grandmother came and said, my mother-in-law brought this water from San Juan del Valle 30 years ago. Can we use this water? Can we pour some of this water into the water that you're going to use to baptize. Am I going to tell the woman no? <laughs> if I tell her no, would that be being a pastoral? That's not a pastoral response. To tell her, oh, no, 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 no. 30-year-old water from San Juan? No, no, no. It's lost its blessing by now. No. <laughs> the pastoral response, according to this document, then, is acknowledging the wishes of the family's concern, which means that if grandma wants to use this water to baptize her child, which is brought by her mother-in-law, how beautiful. That's the wish of the family. So long as it's okay with the parents, I mean, presuming the parents don't have an issue with this, then why not somehow add this to the right and even give it significance, right? If this child who's about to be baptized is being baptized in water by her great-grandparents that her great-grandparents brought from San Juan, I mean, it just speaks to how this intergenerational connectivity, all of us, you know, this faith that has been passed on to us through the generations and now this child is being baptized in this water. So we always want to be conscious of the circumstances and the wishes of the family's concern. So they come to you and say, Deacon Cleophas, we really want to be baptized in Lady Bird Lake. Okay. Uh, you know, ordinarily we baptize in the church, but obviously there's some reason for which this person is requesting baptism in Lady Bird Lake. Are you going to tell the person no? I mean, yes, Big and Jim will be happy to go. So, Father, yes, ma'am. You, as an American Catholic church priest, would do this. Would a Roman Catholic church priest 
be willing to do these? No. So, <laughs> so what we do is we come to this discussion in the Catholic Church then we tend to use words like when we talk about the, the sacraments, we talk about the validity of the sacrament and the licitness of the sacrament. Do you remember this discussion from other courses? Mm -hmm. So we talk about a sacrament being valid and a sacrament being licit. To be valid, you simply need to baptize with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who baptizes with water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that is a valid baptism. Is it licit? Now that's another question. What is licit another word for? Legal. So every church has its code, its canons, for saying what makes a sacrament legal or not. So if I were a Roman Catholic priest, I would probably have to confer the, the, the norms of my diocese to see what it says, because it might say, and ministers of baptism... Uh, you know, maybe it will say that we only celebrate in the church except in extreme circumstances. So if I'm a Roman Catholic church and I decide to go down to Lady Bird Lake and baptize, what will happen? The sacrament is valid. It's simply not licit. Uh, it's illegal. I shouldn't have done it, but even though I did it, it's still valid. I may get in trouble with the higher-ups because I didn't follow the rules, but it's still valid. Deacon Wright? Didn't uh, the, the deacons used to be able to baptize just about anywhere? I think they cut them off not a, a few years ago. So in the, in the, let's go back to the ancient church. Did we have to be baptized in a certain place? In a certain, I mean, the ancient church went down to the river. Hippolytus tells us, remember the Acts of Hippolytus, one of the early records of the Island Baptist? And then they went down to the river. Did they have to go to a certain spot in the river? I mean, it's sort of like, before we weren't so preoccupied with this, but more recently, for instance, in the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, the pastoral manual is some 500 pages thick. So when I became the pastor of, pa of a parish in the Roman Catholic Church, what did that mean? There were 500 pages of rules suddenly that I had to, I had to spend a few late nights studying just to make sure that I at least knew the rules that I might be breaking. Right? Got to at least know the rules that we're playing with here. <laughs> and so, it's an excellent question that has to do with the, the licitness of the sacraments. For the Catholic Church, what has always been important is the validity of the sacraments. So, we can be all caught up in terms of, you know, all these other rules, the licitness, these are rules that we as human beings have made up, right? What makes a sacrament legal or not? In order for it to be a legal baptism, you have to perform it in the church. Okay? It's the, the same is true, for instance, of weddings, right? In the Roman Catholic Church, weddings must be performed in a church, which is why we in the American Catholic Church are so popular for weddings. Why? Because in the Roman Catholic Church, unless there's an extraordinary circumstance, you must be married in a church. If you got married in a park, it would be valid, but it would not be illicit. It's not legal. It's going against the rules if you're a Roman Catholic and are married in a park without the permission of the bishop. And so, for us, the focus is here on validity. So long as the sacraments are valid, the licitness we recognize has to do with rules that were made up like people like you and me. Thou shalt get married only in a church. You're going to go find that in the Bible. Other things that deacons and priests and bishops, the ordinary ministers of baptism should do, it says that they should perform the rite of baptism with exactness and reverence. Ooh, think about those two words for a moment. Exactness, meaning this is the rite of the church. If I deviate from this too much, if I create Father Jamie's rite of baptism with all sorts of sound effects and light effects and magic tricks or whatever, okay, that's nice, maybe. <laughs> but is that the church's rite? The church doesn't ordain me to create my own rites. It, it ordains me to celebrate the rites of the church. And this is the rite of the church. And so when it comes to baptisms, I follow the rite of the church. When it comes to the Mass, did you notice? When I say, let us pray, I don't make up my own words. They bring the book to me, and I read the book. Right? It's the church's rites that are prayed throughout the world, and from which we don't deviate to a large extent, unless, we're, unless for for some reason. 
So we celebrate the, the rite with a certain exactness, it says, and with reverence, simply meaning that we, this is, it's a moment of prayer. It's an encounter with God. And so as ministers, we celebrate with reverence. The next line, interesting, how should our deacons and priests and bishops be? It says, they must also try to be understanding and friendly to all. I don't know what the context was, was for this in the 1960s, whether there were some real curmudgeon priests and deacons. This was an encouragement for those curmudgeon priests and deacons, if indeed there were at that time. Yeah. Um, can I ask that? Were the poor deacons in 69? For them to be friendly and understanding. Deacon's question is, were there deacons in 1969? I mean, it was really the Second Vatican Council that rebirthed this idea of involving lay persons, married persons, persons in different life states in the ministry of the church. Wow. So that was a, that was a recent innovation in the Roman church. We